People say things will get worse and worse, and then the righteous will be raptured. But is that just an excuse to sin? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. The idea that everything will get worse and worse, and then the good people will be raptured away, that's that's commonly believed in the church, and that comes from 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about that the you know the dead will rise first and meet Christ in the air. Early in 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 22 through 26, that's not when it says Christ will return. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his order. Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So in this verse, God is very clear that he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. He received his kingdom, it says in, in Acts 2, when he rose to, and went to the Father. And so he reigns at the right hand of the Father until all his enemies are put in his, or made his footstool. And then he comes to defeat the last enemy, which is death. And so that's what it's teaching there. But yet, and so the rapture, the rapture, if you want to use that term, it does happen. It happens when he comes to judge the world with fire. It doesn't happen before then. So why is there such a desire to believe that things will get worse and worse and then Christ will return? So I want to be careful how I answer this because, I mean, we've done other episodes on dispensationalism, and I don't want to paint everyone who believes in dispensationalism with this brush. But there is a part of it where those who teach and really desire this, and there, I mean, that's, and that's really the emphasis there. There are people who like the idea of the world getting darker and darker. And I don't, and I don't mean like it in the sense of they, wouldn't, they don't want bad things to happen to them. To them. But they like the idea of there being no pressure on the church. They like the idea of the church having no real power in the world. There are people who like that. And and we should expect there to be people who desire evil things in the church trying to affect the church. And this is why I'm saying I don't want to put everybody in dispensationalism in this group. But it it does really give an excuse to sin. It does give an excuse for there to be even carnality in the church. It gives an excuse for the church to have no effect. It gives there's a there's a lot of and, and there are wolves that have been in the church and have been active in the church that have used this to cause real damage to the church. And it's caused real damage to the culture. It's caused damage to the world. And again, like I said, I'm not saying everybody who's a dispensational thinks this, but you should understand there are people who have used this doctrine to great evil effect. And so obviously as someone who's very much against the the framework of dispensationalism, who's very much against its eschatology and and all the things, you know, basically, you know, most of the things that it teaches, I think that Scripture doesn't teach this. And I think that if some, so even those who I think hold to the dispensational framework, I think there's still real harm by it. But I don't think every single person there desires that evil to you know, that that things get darker. Well, I think a lot of them desire that to be the doctrine, though. In this sense, I can tell you as an elder, as a pastor of a church, when you preach and nobody changes, and everybody continues to live in their carnality, it's really comforting to go. Well, that's what's supposed to happen. So they may even want sure. people to be holy, and they might even be righteous in that but i mean this is you you martin lloyd jones i can think of other people who they come near the end of their life and they look at their church martin lloyd jones you know good preacher right excellent preacher but yet he looks at the end of his ministry when he comes close to the end of his life and says i've never had any effect on anybody's life well it's really comforting and i'm not saying he did this but i'm saying that that there's lots of people that end up in that situation because God provides whatever increase he wants to provide. And so you end up and you go, well, it wasn't my fault. And that gives you great comfort. And so people change their doctrine based on that. And they change their understanding of what things mean because it makes them feel more productive. So even the ones that go, I'm being purified, 
a lot of times they still like the doctrine because they look at their church and go, but the people out there aren't. And if you're doubting that people would have that motivation, I mean, imagine like people in you know Congress. I, I'd imagine there's some people in Congress who would rather be in the minority because it's hard to be in the majority. You have to take the blame for what's going on because you're the one with power. It's easy to be in the minority and say things are so bad. You know, if only we were in control, they'd be better. And so you you know you translate that into spiritual things where it's a spiritual battle and you know you there's not uh you can't go on wikipedia and see who has the majority and so if you define yourself as the minority you can take no blame and have theoretical solutions for everything that you know will never be put in place or i mean so i like your example but let me narrow it down a little bit which would be you had a bunch of republicans that not that long ago went we don't like the republican majority leader it's his fault that we're not accomplishing anything and to some extent that's what the church does with god it says we're not accomplishing anything it's god's fault he's in charge and he's not doing it and it gives you comfort because all of a sudden you know i was doing the right thing i just i just didn't have control. God decided things were going to grow worse and worse. Right. And I mean, you literally, you literally say this is his plan. Right. His design is for this to happen. And that's, that is, that is really a big part of it. And like I said, while I think over this course of this episode, we're not going to spend, we're not going to, this is, we've already done an episode kind of on dispensationalism. We'll probably, I think we'll probably have done an episode on the rapture before this episode gets published and talked about the specifics of the rapture. We're not going to go into great detail about this here, but in the end, it's the it's the kind of the framework of that thinking. How does Scripture teach against the idea that why should we think that it's not going to get darker? Does God establish this in any clear way? Does he show that, no, I will be triumphant in the world in a real way, in a way that's tangible, that you can see it, and is the, is that found in scripture and how how can we how can we find that and ultimately if that is found in scripture what's my responsibility and because that that gets at the answer to the original question of why would anybody want to believe this well one of the reasons you might want to believe it is just because ultimately it removes responsibility if if you can't be blamed for something then you also can't be held responsible for it if you can't be held responsible for it then you didn't have anything you had to do. You didn't, you weren't, there were no expectations on you. And if there's no expectations on you, you can kind of do what you want to do. I think, you know, a lot of this comes from, you know, Second Timothy 3, where it says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them and from and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus and the first part is about individuals and then it's about Timothy has to go learn things but then they take the evil men and imposters and make that about group and say the evil men and imposters they'll grow worse and worse not individually but as a group that's where they base this idea that things will get worse and worse that's not what the verse is talking about somebody who's an imposter we we see this all the time you see somebody like mark driscoll and he starts out bad but he gets worse and worse right i mean we know how it works it's not like it's deceiving Sin we have this like all yeast. the time it grows like yeast and that's what this is saying but people have taken this and made this eschatological when it's actually very practical, Timothy, make sure you're not like that. Make sure because you're either growing or you're dying. And and to take that and make that then this is what's going to happen in the world, I'm sorry, that's just not – it just gives an excuse to say, well, people get worse and worse. What do you expect? Instead of saying, no, the church is actually salt. It's actually light. It's actually supposed to make things better. And this is this is a common hermeneutical mistake that, I mean, even people who have – doctrine I would agree with do this at times where there are verses that establish a certain eschatological view. There'll be another verse that's talking about something that's that doesn't ne- is not talking about that eschatological view and they'll use it in a way that they shouldn't. I mean and that's that's literally what's happening here is they have this mindset already that the world is going to grow worse and worse. So when they read that verse, they just go, I'm going to read it that way because that it goes in line with what I'm already thinking. But you you can't do that with Scripture. You should not make that mistake with Scripture. And and part of it is what we're going to do is we're going to try to look at verses 
that where God is talking very specifically about what he is going to do in the world, kind of like you did when you were reading in the verse where the rapture is found, you know, the rapture is supposedly found, where it talks about what the end will actually look like. We're going to look at other passages in the scripture where God's laying down these these really big aspects of the world's history and saying, Do you this is what I'm going to do in the history of the world? This is how you can look at it, and this is how you can make sense of it. And you have to, if you're going to do that, you have to go to Psalm 110, because Psalm 110 is, I mean, it's the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. It tells you what's going to happen. It was quoted in what I just read from 1 Corinthians 15. Psalm 110, 1 through 3, a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies, Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. And a lot of times, right, it just gets quoted the first part about he'll make his enemies his footstool. But I think when we think about why that other doctrine, the idea of a rapture, is, is, you know, popular, it's because of the second part, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, meaning that People will go and do the work. When Christ is reigning in their heart, they will go and do the work for the gospel. They will go and, and it doesn't mean that everybody's doing the same work. There's different, you know, parts of the body. But in the parable of the sower, where he's talking about, you know, some so that, you know, some seed goes on fallow ground, some seed goes on, on where there's thorns and thistles, and some seed falls on good ground. And the seed that get, falls on the good ground produces 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. When, he, when Christ talks about how he's going to take the vineyard and give it to another that will produce the fruits of righteousness, right, that was not produced by Israel, I mean, these are all the same idea, is that the true church actually produces fruit. It actually affects the world. It actually gives God what he wants. And so that's what his reign looks like. And his reign has been established. That's clear from Scripture. If you, I mean, it's quoted that this has happened, that he's ascended and that he's reigning. And so all of a sudden that means we have a real responsibility as Christians to be volunteers in the day of Christ's power because it is the day of his power already. What you're talking about with volunteers goes down to just the real basics of what is your expectation of a Christian. Is your expectation of what it means to be a Christian, to live a Christian life, that you have fire insurance and so forth, you know, that kind of a a view? Or, and and we've talked about this in so many episodes, is your expectation that when God saves you, he saves you because he has work in mind that needs to be done and you're expected to participate in that work? That work won't save you. Inspected to want to participate in that work, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you know, and the work does not save you, but the work is what you get saved for. God saves you because the world needs turning around and you're part of that project. He says this in Ephesians 2, starting in verse eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And you're just, you know, this is saying something about what it means to be a Christian. Your expectation is when I get saved, God had a plan, a program in mind that he was plugging me into that was this pathway of good works that I'm now supposed to be partaking in. And that means something. That means I have to do stuff. I mean, and he says something even more that is, that's really fundamental. We are his workmanship. Mm. And there's this part where when you think about work, I mean, one of the fundamental things about work, you ask any man, man, they identify with their work and they want to be good at their work. I mean, like I remember one time somebody recommended somebody to hire and like, this guy's really good. He's really reliable. And the guy was a nice guy. He was reliable. He was not good at what he did. And I hired him and he kept having to come back and have to fix it. And then it took, you know, and he kept coming back, but it took like, you know, and I remember the next time I was like asking about somebody again, and they're oh, this guy's really nice, really, you know, and I was going, I'm not hiring that guy again. He's not good at his work. He doesn't know how to do his work. And God, God does. Jesus is not a poor workman. And so if he, if we are his workmanship, it's an insult to then say that the workmanship that he's that the work he's created he's created us and he's created us to do work 
And if he hasn't created us to be able to do that work, that's a reflection of him. And so, I mean, it, this is just this is just really fundamental. And it's really important to understand what God is doing, which we're going to talk in a minute from Daniel too, because you know that's probably the clearest place in Scripture that lays it out. But God actually has a plan, and we need to think of ourselves as slaves. Well, if a slave master buys a slave, he doesn't just go, hey, that guy's cheap, I'll buy him. He goes, I have a job for them to do, that I'm going to buy them, redeem them, so that they can do that job. And God is looking and saying, this is what I'm doing with my church, this is what I'm doing with my kingdom, and so I'm going to buy slaves so that they do the work that's needed to accomplish what I want to do, which is what it means, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He knows what his plan is. He knows what work he's hiring us to do, and then he hires us to do his work, and then the kingdom moves forward. Which is just a very different worldview. It's it, I, And I mean worldview kind of in a literal sense. It's a very different way of looking at the entirety of the world to think that way rather than to think that God's plan is for everything to just fall apart. And it really says something about the nature of God as a husband because he's going to abuse his church and have everything fall apart. That he's, I mean, how would you like it that you— you ask for a girl to, you know, ask a, a young woman to marry you, and then, you know, you have a nice house and a nice car, and by the time she, like, gets married, the car's falling apart, the house is, you know, falling to the ground. Well, that's that's what that eschatology thinks of God, that that's the right thing, is that you go, look at all these things that I have, and then you make sure that they're all destroyed before you actually get married. That That's not God. That's not righteous for a man to do that, a human man, and that's obviously not what God does. Instead, God says, you know, in Matthew 28, he says what he's going to do. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. He says this is what his plan is. His plan is for the nations to learn all he commanded, the nations to learn who the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is. He's, he's commanding for the gospel to go forth and transform the world because it's not just baptize them, it's teach them to obey all things I've commanded you. And as we go back and we look at Daniel 2, and you, and you have this verse in mind, well, I'm sure we're going to be coming back and making reference to this, that these two things line up. If you don't, if you don't look at the Great Commission— in the context of Daniel 2, then it doesn't make sense. And Psalm 110, right? Right. Because they all tie together. I mean, this is this is what God's doing. He said what he was going to do. He prophesied what he was going to do. He had a song sung about what he was going to do, and then we go, he's not doing that. It's the Great Commission that starts with all authority has been given to him. If, right. if all authority has been given to Jesus and Psalm 110, he's waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool, then why is our expectation that everything's supposed to get worse? If Jesus has all authority, honestly, He it's, says he's ruling the nations with a rod of iron. How can he get worse when he's ruling the nations with a rod of iron? It's blasphemy of God to say that, you, that Jesus has been given all authority and that he will do nothing with that. Even though, it, you know, it, he'll... Crush the nations, it says, too. So it's also that he lied, because you also have to reject Scripture to get to that point. Yeah, you know, we've mentioned Daniel 2 a couple times, and it's really important to understand what happens with Daniel 2, because God is telling Nebuchadnezzar, and through, Nebuch- and through Daniel's interpretation, he's basically giving the, the rest of the history of the world, right? And especially to the destruction of the Jews, to the, to the, the kingdoms that will come until Christ establishes his kingdom. And, and there's some very interesting things in there that, that show what we're supposed to do, what the good works look like. So let's read Daniel 2, 31 through 35. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. 
The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. And so Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and then the rest of Daniel, and you can go through, we're not going to spend the time here to go through, it explains who these things are, right? It's basically the, the gold is, is Nebuchadnezzar, the silver is the Medes and the Persians, the belly of bronze is the, is the, the Greek empire, and then the legs and the feet are the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic. So when you have this stone, you know, Daniel later reveals that the stone is the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom that's going to come and destroy all the kingdoms of the world. So when we think about what the work that Christ is doing in the world, that stone that becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth, that's that's the church and that's the people of God taking dominion for God. That's the fulfillment of Matthew 28. But the fulfillment of Matthew 28 is also that the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold are crushed together and become like chaff from the summer threshing floor. Well, how do they get crushed together? How do they become like chaff? Well, that's actually the job of the church. That's the fulfillment of the, the Great Commission. And it's really important when you, when you actually look at the fulfillment. It says, you know, so it's like in history, he said there's going to be a kingdom, you know, you're, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. And then there will be a kingdom that comes after you, inferior to yours. And then he talks about, and it goes down. And then it says that stone will come and it will strike the feet and the whole thing will be crushed. And so there's this part of it where he's even telling you like in history where the stone will come. But when the stone comes, it crushes all of them. And that's really important. That's kind of what you're saying is even though Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom had passed, even though there had been these other kingdoms, one of the other things that's really important to point out about this is that at the beginning when it says there was an image, that word for image is, is idol. And so what's being crushed isn't just those kingdoms, but also the idolatry associated with those kingdoms. And so when he says it's going to come, even though Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom has passed, even though the Medes and Persian have passed, the idolatry associated with those kingdoms has not ended until the kingdom of God destroys it. Right. There's still threads of thought that go through. I mean, the most obvious would be the Greeks, right? The Greeks were known to be the intellectuals. They were the ones that are seeking something new. And this is, you know, the worship of intellectualism is the picture of the Greek empire. Well, that continues even once the Romans take them over. That doesn't disappear. That thread continues. And so when the church is supposed to go and destroy that thread, that idolatry of education, well, or that idolatry of knowledge would be a better way to put it, it, it still exists even though the kingdom isn't there, even though that empire has passed on. And so you see these four, and these are representing four, as you said, normal idolatry of man, normal threads that run through human society. And this is why you see, like in Revelation, you see references to like Babylon, you still see reference because in the end, what Babylon represented is being destroyed by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Which is so when you look at these things, you understand there's a reason why you see these names. This this prophecy is so central to the history of the world that unless you ground it, you know, it can't be it can't be shoved over to the side. It's a major piece that has to be laid down and it has to be dealt with. There I mean these particular kingdoms are types of the ways that you build a kingdom, an empire. If you know, you, you would be hard pressed to come up with any kind of kingdom that you can't say is like one of these four or five, depending how you separate Rome. So, I mean, one of the other verses that that deals with the establishment of Christ's authority and this kingdom is in Daniel two forty four. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. There's another reference that we're not going to read that talks about where it says that Daniel says, In the night I saw a vision of the Son of Man, and he was, and he was caught up in the clouds, and he comes to the Ancient of Days, and there he is given authority. And you can see how that ties directly back to the, to the Great Commission, where God gives him this commission, and then he is caught up in the clouds and comes to God the Father and sets at his right hand. And I think one of the things people just, they forget, is that the the most important thing that happens, Christ's coronation, is going to happen in heaven. And so there's a part of where, because it like happens out of their sight, they don't think about the reality of it. But 
that's where Christ is that's where Christ is is crowned that's where Christ has given his authority but before he leaves he gives the commission to the church because his kingdom is being established that kingdom that's talked about in, in Nebuchadnezzar's vision that kingdom that's going to strike the feet and begin that process of crushing all these kingdoms so I think what we want to do with the balance of the the rest of this podcast is we want to just go through and look at each one of these particular kingdoms and just say, what's that kingdom stand for? And how is it in conflict with Christ? And and what is the nature of that conflict with Christ? What is our expectation about how Christ will be destroying that kingdom in its details? And you start with Babylon. I mean, Babylon's the head. It's this, it's this head of gold. What's that, what's that showing us? What are we supposed to think about that? And I think it goes back to you know, the Tower of Babel, which was at the same place. And you have Nimrod, and he's leading all the people. And they build a, you know, they want to replace, and they want to sit in the place of God. And so you have Nebuchadnezzar that's bearing that same exact picture. Right? It says in Daniel 2.37, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. I mean, he's the king of kings. He's a picture of Christ. But at the same time, he's also a picture of Satan because he's a type of Christ, but he's also a type of Satan, because Satan blinded the nations. And so you have this idea that Nebuchadnezzar is ruling over all the nations, just like, in a sense, Satan was ruling over all the nations. When he takes Christ and, when, and offers to him the kingdoms of the world, right? Right. When you say he's a picture of Satan, I mean, well, we, we kind of get that when we see what God judges him for. All of the things that Nebuchadnezzar does, we know he does lots of, of wicked things, but God ultimately judges him for pride. Which is, I mean, that's Satan's problem, ultimately, is his pride. And it's, and it's when Nebuchadnezzar goes up and he looks out over his city and, look at, and he says, look at this great thing that my hands have made. That's when God says, nope, that's too far. That's too much. You're going to eat grass like an ox. Right, and it's the same kind of idea that, you know, instead of crawling around in dust all your days, you're going to eat grass like an ox, right? He takes him from a position of high authority, high respect and honor, and takes him down to eating grass. And so you have that picture. And so when we, when we look, you know, there is this idea that we'll give absolute authority to people, that, that that's kind of the, the Babylonian Empire. And that's the picture of the Babylonian Empire is that you give this ultimate authority to men. And, and the church fought this for a long time, and it's, I think a lot of people don't know history very well to recognize. I mean, the divine right of kings was, that's what was going on with the United States, and that's how the United States got founded. And that really is directly related to this idea of the Babylonian Empire and the idea that Nebuchadnezzar, he could kill anybody that he wanted to. He had ultimate authority. There was no authorities. And over that time, that was checked far before the American Revolution, that kings still had to deal with ministers. And there was, you know, from Magna Carta, there was a split up of the of the, the authority of the king versus the authority of the lords. And so a lot of these things had happened before, but all that is this picture of tearing down that, that absolute authority. And now you look at them in the world and how many totalitarian dictators are there? You know, you have, you have the, the president of North Korea – or even and what we call drops, totalitarian, right. right? I mean, we 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 look at we we talk about the federal government being totalitarian, and they do take more authority, but it's nowhere near on the scale of what even what like you said what North Korea would be like. Or they say Putin is, but the reality is Putin has a Congress. He has to deal with all these other people. He's not like Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, everybody, you know, he says when the song gets played, everybody has to bow down in the kingdom, and everybody starts bowing down in the kingdom so that. The Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, people go, well, obviously they're in rebellion. Well, right. he's he's king over almost 200 nations, and they're all bowing down except for three people. That is not what authoritarian dictators look like now. And you, you talked about the divine right of kings, but I would say by the time you even get to the divine right of kings, you already see how Christ is destroying that idea. Right. Because you have these kings who basically said, I am a god, or when I die, I will become a god. And you know, and by the time you get to the Middle Ages and people are arguing about the divine right of kings, they're saying, well, I get my authority from God, you know, therefore there's nobody above me. I mean, even then it's derivative, and ultimately it, you know, it, nobody believes that anymore. So you can just see the progress of how Christ has destroyed this idea of 
absolute authority as located anywhere except in him, the person who say, I have all authority. And it really goes back to where the church meets, and there's a synod that basically says, no, Con- Constantine can't become a god. That's not possible. And you really look before that, everybody's thinking of the empire cult and all this, or the emperor cult and all this other stuff about how the people that are the, the most powerful person in the world, they become a god. And it's the church that goes, no, that's not how it works. And we forget that the church has that much power, or we ignore the power because we'd rather say things are supposed to get worse rather than saying, no, actually, we're supposed to be doing things. And you have that even all the way up to World War II, right, where there is the, the, the Japanese are looking at the emperor as a god, right, even up to World War II. And then part of losing World War II is like, no, the emperor is not god. And there's even you look at Japan and stuff where they're where the – they had to put a Shinto temple inside the vestibule of every church because that was the only way the church could be there. So the church was even bowing down and kowtowing to it instead of doing like what we're kind of advocating in this episode is the church is supposed to do what the church is supposed to do, and they weren't doing it in Japan. And so that's why Japan continues that way. So the nation's shocked when the emperor goes on, on radio and goes, I'm not a god. But that's because there wasn't, the church was failing to do what it was supposed to be doing, and because of that, people actually thought men could become gods. Right. And I think when you when you contrast this with the uh, Great Commission, where it says to make disciples of the nations, I think we even think of that wrong because there's a part of it was there's a part of it where when the church said Constantine can't become a god, the nation began to follow after the commands of Christ. They actually began to say, "Oh, you're right. He can't become a god." And so I think when we think of them becoming a di- disciple, we think of it as the whole the nation immediately becomes this complete convert, and they immediately become completely saved. No, they be- they begin to follow after God's commands. And there's so many things. I mean, where we've talked about, where even in America we see the decay of like jurisprudence and of and of like due process and all these things. Where, but those are the fact that they exist was a result of the nations beginning to follow after the commands of God. And so this is an aspect of the Great Commission where Christ is sending the church out to speak to the world. And this is the distinction between the church and the kingdom, is that Christ's kingdom is him exerting his influence over the world. His authority. His authority, and right. Well, and doing that through the influence of the church. And, and you know, and so when we're referencing this Council on Constantine, I mean, that was kind of— Constantine becoming a god was kind of in the background. I mean, the issue on the table was, was Christ a man who became a god? You know, Arianism. Um, And the thing is, when we think about that, we shouldn't think that there was this great showdown and then they get rid of Arianism and it's all over. I mean, it it was a battle for a long time and it wasn't something that it was a simple, you know, check the box and you're done. You know, it was a, you know, I've, you know, been reading to the kids about people from the, you know, whatever heroes of the early church. And the per- person after person was standing against Arianism, and they were being exiled repeatedly. They were losing their church. It was, it seemed like the Arians were winning for a long time until finally now, I mean, there's, if you're a true Arian, you're in a cult. I mean, no, like, I mean, the Arianism is dead and long dead. I mean, it's yeah, trying Mormonism's to, kind of Arianism. Well, no, but it's, that's, a, that's a cult. I mean, that's it's a very topic. large cult. But yeah, anyway, it's a large yes. cult. But I mean, you're you're pretty wacko. I mean, it's even the Catholics aren't Arian, pure Arian. Um, so, you know, it is something that tries to come back. But it's something where you look at the the uh, some of the kingdom parables, and it talks about how the kingdom of heaven is like the leaven that's put into the dough, and you look at that. And you look at the dough when you put the leaven in, and then you look at it when it's done rising, and there's a dramatic change. But it's not a change in terms of always a big showdown. It's something that gradually builds, and before you know it, it's thoroughly affected by it. But it's, I mean, we might be able to, you know, Protestant, you know, Reformation, Martin Luther nailing 95 Theses. I mean, that's a showdown. But those are rare events. And normally it's more of a progressive type thing that is happening under the surface and the things that are really shaping stuff, no one is even realizing what's going on. And I think 
you know, we don't want to say this has been defeated either, because I would actually argue that that what's happening with Donald Trump and the church right now is in the same nature, the same nature of what needs to be destroyed. There's a lot of people who basically, you know, a lot of Christian conservatives go, basically, Donald Trump is right. He's the person and he's, we have to believe that he's saved. And, and it's not Aaronism, but it's related to it. It's still connected to it. It's still part of that it has kingdom. The same spirit kind of. Where you're, you're idolizing men and you're raising up a man and everybody's going, well, 34% of the electorate, they'll vote for Donald Trump even if he shot somebody in Times Square, which is what right. he said would happen. People would still vote for him. That whole attitude, the church needs to be speaking against in the church. So the work in destroying this kingdom isn't done. Even as we talk about it, it is, as Joshua described, it's expanding. The leaven's gone. I would argue probably against this kingdom better than any of the other ones. But yet, there's still a lot of work to be done, and it still constantly comes back where there's a form of it that comes back of idolatry towards men. And, but at this point, you can definitely see the progress. You know, yeah. Donald Trump, as as a god, is so inferior to Nebuchadnezzar. You know, it, and and the church has got vocabulary to speak against that. They have ammunition to deal with that. Now, whether they, they do, but it's there. You can see there has been real progress in this one, no question. Right. The The scary part is how quickly the evangelical church in particular is willing to throw yeah. away those those type things and, rec- and forget the fact we're supposed to be destroying it, making it like chaff on the summer threshing floor. We're not supposed to be embracing it because, because we think more money will be in our pockets. The next one, the Medes and the Persians. You know, reading the Medes and the Persians – you know, the, the next two are actually pretty easy because there's a lot of history about what happens. But I think if you look at the Medes and the Persians, what's recorded in Scripture about them, it it has to, or it comes down to hedonism, the seeking of, of pleasure on this earth. And you look at Esther. Esther is a good example, the first part of Esther. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars, and the couches were of gold and silver on the mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, and white and black marble. And they served drinks in golden vessels, each vessel being different from the other, with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure." And so there's all this this wealth. There's, I mean, a 180-day party. I mean, there's like... Followed by a seven-day party. <laughs> followed by a seven-day party where everybody gets a, gold, a golden vessel to drink out of, whether you're rich or poor. I mean, there's just this. And then you consider, you know, he tries to find a wife after Vashti rises up and refuses to, to you know, come to her husband. And then he sleeps with a different woman every night. I mean... This is a picture of hedonism, and we can obviously see that this the the idol of hedonism isn't isn't dead. I mean, if we look around in our culture, I mean, we're our culture may not be exactly like that, but there are real elements. I mean, <laughs> it right. might be worse than what I mean, right? I mean, and some of it is in the abundance of things, and but in the end, I mean, I don't know that it's 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 as ostentation as 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 ostentatious as that was in certain ways. But it's certainly it's certainly alive and well. And this is like waves. You go back to, you know, you go back to Puritan New England, and there was a lot of this that was being suppressed. Then you go to you know, nineteenth century England, and everybody was drunk all the time, so it's very much in full bloom. And then it kind of, you know you go back to the U.S. and there was a, a decline of this, and the church had some advance. And then you hit the sixties, and all of a sudden the church loses all its ground, and uh, the drug and sex culture just takes over the church. I mean, not takes over the church, but takes over America. And, and now the church, you know, there's a lot of visible churches or things that call themselves churches that embrace homosexuality, that embrace the, 
the the gender confusion and embra- embrace all these things that are just pure hedonism. And so I think the church, we've seen how the church can constrain things. There's lots of societies that have kept the Sabbath. That's a good example of of anti hedonism, right? Because right. it's it's testifying that there's a rest that for the people of God that it's not chasing things of this world. As opposed to you know, but when the church loses the Sabbath, my guess is is that also is a as a a, a a indicator that it's rejected the the idea that it should be making the the kingdom of the Medes and Persia like chaff on the summer threshing floor. But but even here, you can identify things where there have been real progress. Like you look like aside from Muslim countries, like where can you where is there polygamy in the earth? I mean, there's I mean. Again, Mormonism. <laughs> well, no, even Mormonism. I, I even know. Mormonism. Uh, publicly, they <laughs> and widespread. They don't have any doctoral basis for it, but they widespread. Most are, are uh, they are not polygamous. Right. It's the right. it's the it's the Mormon breakaway no, no, sex. But, it, but it, the, it was a cheap shot just to bring Mormonism up again. <laughs> every every there's gonna be one hundred amendments of Mormonism, <laughs> <laughs> but. But, yeah, I mean, you know, so, I mean, there is one, and not that everyone who only has one wife, obviously, is is living in a non-hedonist way, but it, it is it is very different to say you can, you know, if you're the rich guy, you're the king, you just go marry as many people as you want to, versus saying, no, we we know that it the, the truth is you can only have one wife, and so everyone else has to be a mistress, and probably a secret mistress, and that is a real progress. Take the case that's been in the news last several years about Jeffrey Epstein, and you could say, hey, we have got a real hedonist on our hands here and a man who was promoting hedonism for anybody who had the money to pay for it or influence that he wanted to to get over them. But even all of that, you realize, was suppressed and things were done in secret and you have to go to a faraway island because you're not advertising it in, you know, in your front yard for the in, you know, everybody to participate in because you realize where the cultures move to. This isn't something that you can do openly. And when it gets done openly, it's a great scandal. And people are pushing for it to be done openly, right? There's, they even have terms for, you know, minor, minority attracted persons and this other garbage because there's a real thrust of the culture to move in that direction, but it hasn't gotten there yet. And even in, you know, you said in Muslim countries, so Muslim countries, they have a, at least a technical limit of four wives, which didn't, which even that is a constraint. And so, because it wasn't like that before, I mean, Solomon had, you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. So, you know, and, you know, Azaras had a lot, you know, he had a different woman every night. So, so there has been real progress made, but, I don't think the church in our generation, we can't sit back and say that in America, in our generation, there's been much progress made. We've been losing ground, and we, we've we been given this work to do, and we're not doing the work. We're not being the volunteers in this day. So what's the church supposed to say about that? Is is the church supposed to have this attitude, like we were pushing against at the beginning, of, oh, no, it's all getting worse— or do we look at a, a local time and geography and say it's getting worse here? That means something has to be done. That means there's work to do. That might be hard work. And I, I can even tell you what work I think needs to be done here because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 32, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts in Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And so we know why people go to eating and drinking. It's because they have no view of eternal life. And because they have no view of eternal life, all they're going to do— Paul even says, if you have no view of eternal life— you might as well seek the pleasures on this life because if you don't think that there's a bodily resurrection, psh, it doesn't matter. You know, I the one many years ago I was teaching a Bible study at a nursing home and I mentioned the bodily resurrection. These people, some of them had taught Sunday school for 80 years. And they even got nurses in that were listening to me explain the bodily because nobody had heard of it in this room with, you know, 25 people that have been in church their whole life. Well, this is how you get the state that we are in America. 
is because the church doesn't talk about the resurrection. When you look at some place like Romans 2 where it says we'll be judged according to our deeds, and the way that we're judged according to our deeds is are we seeking eternal life or not? Right. And so you beat hedonism by saying there's more than this world. When the church says there's not more than this world, hedonism will always beat the church because the church isn't supposed to fix I mean, it's not supposed to give you satisfaction in this world. Paul didn't fight with the beasts at Ephesus. The people in Fox's Book of Martyrs did not go and get burned with bags of gunpowder in their armpits because they wanted the pleasures of this world. You know, you know the, the Hall of Faith in Hebrews where it talks about it, it's all because they sought a kingdom or a country who's, who, you know, a, a perfect country, a, a city whose builder and maker was God. It was all about eternal life. When the church forgets the message of eternal life, it cannot defeat hedonism. Hedonism will always defeat it. Right. I mean, the, the other episode we recorded tonight was on the wrath of God. And there's a part of it where, I mean, when you look at eternal life, one of the reasons you look at eternal life is because you understand the wrath of God. And so, I mean, these things, they they feed into one another that people don't think, oh, that, that you know, like you said, you eat and drink today, but that it's not that the eating and drinking today isn't worth the wrath, that it's, it's, there is no comparison between the two, that this is nothing compared to the horror of God's wrath being poured out upon you. And so you should, you should seek eternal life. And so, I mean, yeah, all these things, they kind of they push. And when the church doesn't teach these things, people have no reason to think about them. They have, when you talk about, like, because one of the things I was thinking of was prayer and fasting are one of the ways that you deal with hedonism. But... To do yourself. Prayer, yeah. Right. But to deal with but to do those things, you have to have a view of eternal life. I mean, it's like by themselves, otherwise it's just asceticism, you know, or it's just And if we're not saying things about eternal life in the culture, we can't expect the culture to have any view greater than where am I going to get my next drink? Right. Where am I going to get my next, you know, romantic partner? This is what it comes to. And the church doesn't talk about those things. It talks about how Jesus loves you, not that you are under the wrath of God and you are going to go to hell unless you repent and believe. The The love of Christ and preaching the love of Christ without understanding that it's about eternal life, it, it just produces what we've got in our society. And the world is saying, right, listen to what the world says. The world says if you, if you want this, if you feel like you're a, a girl in a boy's body or a boy in a girl's body or if you want to lay with a man when you're a man – Go do it because this is it. I mean, that is their message, that you only live once, so you should do the things that you want to do. That's that's inherent in the message that started in the 60s and moves forward. You know, free love. Don't worry about it. Just go have sex with whoever you want. Well, the church has done a horrible job of going, that is not true. That is not how it works. That is not who God in heaven is. There will be a judgment day. You know? Appointed for men to die once and then the judgment. The church isn't saying that. And if it doesn't say that, you can't destroy hedonism. I mean, hedonism is an attempt to cope with hopelessness. Yeah. It's, a, it's an attempt to cope with there's nothing else. And, and so given that there's nothing else, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's, that's how Paul's framing it. And the church has an answer for that. The church has an answer that says there is a hope. You know, there and and... Part of that hope is also the fear that comes along with don't ignore it. You can't bury yourself in your hedonism because it's all going to be judged. But there's a hope for it, too. There is something more to it than this life. And that's where you get Hebrews 11 and the Hall of Faith. And all of these people did these things because they had faith in the coming of the sons of God. I mean, when you see the end of that passage that you read about the Medes and the Persians, is the king had ordered them all to do what was ever, you know, whatever they pleased. So this is what the, I mean, this is what the king of the image of hedonism orders you. And like you said, with hopelessness, it also reminded me of in Judges. But there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right according to his own eyes. And this is the contrast, right, is there is a king, and he's Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ's kingdom, Men don't do whatever is right according to their own eyes. I mean, this this really is the contrast. They they do the good works that they have been appointed for. Right. You know, it's not you don't have to define your own path. God has said, now that you're saved, 
there are righteous things that I have for you. Right. And I mean, you look at what, especially when you tie together what, what, you know, it says in Judges, where every man does what's right in his own eyes. And then you have Israel asking for a king right. and Saul comes and, and Samuel's going, why are you reject? And God goes, they didn't reject you. They rejected me as king because it's not just now that they had a king. Right. They had a king then, and they were supposed to be defeating it then, but they weren't doing that. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do as the people of God. Right. And that's why they rejected it. And I think the church, Christ came so that we would have eternal life with him. And we're not talking about the resurrection when we're not talking about that he took on flesh so that we would have a flesh so that in our, in our flesh we could see God. If you're, if you're not talking about that, it gives a whole different view of the gospel and a whole different, different aspect that, that saps it of its power because its power is Christ came. He took on flesh. And you have no explanation why he had to unless you're preaching the resurrection. Paul elsewhere says, unless there's a resurrection of the dead, we're to be the most pitied of all. So the next empire was the Greek empire. You already mentioned this one earlier in the, the podcast, and you mentioned, hey, you think that this stands for the worship of knowledge. So if you want to talk about the worship of knowledge, good Acts 17, where, where Paul is talking to some Greeks. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So when, when we think about the Greek empire, and again, this is another one we know a lot about. There's right. a lot of, we, we have the original source material on this one. We don't have to dig things up. It's all there. And it's, it's really obvious that there were many different ways in which they worshiped knowledge. They worshiped human knowledge. Yeah, they had their pantheon of gods, but the Greeks, they were kind of getting beyond their idolatry in certain ways. At least the elites were. At least the elites. there, Or, or they were, sub, I, I shouldn't say that, because they weren't getting beyond idolatry. They were substituting idolatry for a different kind of idolatry. They were substituting idolatry for the idolatry of the mind. They realized that the, the idols they served were fictions and fables. And so let's come up, let's come up with systems. Let's come up with ways of thinking and starting to do what we would now look at and say, oh, they were doing scientific investigations. You know, they were making observations about the world and making projections, and that's where we get mathematics. And you know, a lot of stuff is happening there for which we want to say we've reaped benefits, but at the same time we have to put it in the context of they were worshiping man. Yeah, because this is one where you can see where the kingdom is is still there's a still structure of the kingdom standing where you have because you know you know when christ comes you know uh rome had already taken over the former empire of alexander the great but still in rome like the foremost scholars were still writing in greek because greek was the you know th th there was kind of those two rival kingdoms there where there was the roman kingdom that we'll get to in a minute but there still was that that no institution of knowledge and you know even today you look at you know a lot of the academic disciplines and and they trace it all the way back to you know their founders are the greeks so you know you know no one's looking so much to the Babylonians or the Medes and Persians as here's our here's our forebears here's our role models but very much the greeks are still are still in there and just the the sort of snide description that you get there in Acts for what they were doing. Oh, they, did, they, they just like to spend all their time in telling and hearing something new. Well, if you think about that as a description of modern academia, it fits pretty well. If you want to go in, and write a PhD dissertation, you know what you have to do? You have to write something new. And there's a whole you bunch of bring an offering. And there's a whole bunch of people for that are doing something new and and most of it's garbage because there's only so much new that you can do. And Paul's point is, like that, he just he rubs it right in their face. This is just a different form of idolatry. You're too superstitious. You're too, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, he's he's showing them that they haven't really replaced their gods. They haven't gotten away from their gods. They've just replaced them. And I think it's really important to look at 
the huge advance that's been made in this area through the church, even though we're losing it a lot now, I would argue too. But most of the people that you think of that established the scientific method, established the, the, the way to think, even the principles of logic, all these things, I mean, they do go back to the Greeks, but it was very much taken over by the church. And it's the church that drives science. It's the church that drives all these things. Because you look at what happens in the world, these aren't coming out of Africa. These aren't coming out of South America. These aren't coming out of out of Asia. These are most of the advances come out of out of Christendom. And so it's because of thinking about the world in a certain way. And it's also thinking about it in terms of taking dominion, because there's a difference, because the Greeks weren't that concerned about taking dominion. They were concerned about taking dominion of the mind rather than taking dominion of the world. So all of a sudden, science becomes like this very useful thing, right? I mean, all the things that we get now from science where we can broadcast something all over the world, well, that really comes from the the church, the kingdom of God, trying to destroy the Greek empire or these this thought of the Greek empire. So the way that you defeat this is you become the, because the church is supposed to understand the world, the people of God are the ones that understand how the world was designed. They understand how it was created, how God is a God of order. And because of that, we should be able to outshine any of these people that are trying to exalt man through through knowledge, because we have the real basis of knowledge and the real basis, the lens through which to work, look at the world through. And historically, that's been true. But yet, historically, also, there's been this counter thread that goes along at the same time, where you have these people that go back and worship the Greeks, because, you know, look at the Enlightenment and the Reformation there at the same time, because, or the Renaissance and the Reformation there at the same time, because it's the same two things. It's the people that are going back and worshiping the Greeks, and then the people that are coming and saying, no, we should be taking, we should be taking reading captive by the kingdom of God. And so that actually explodes, but the other one is what the elites are pushing. So the elites still push that same thing that they've been pushing since, since Aristotle. And it's interesting, too, and this might be painting with, so brought up a brush that it's not helpful anymore, but it seems like there are a lot of strands of the Greek knowledge that have been pruned off. And what we're left with is ones that were deemed to be more compatible with Christian thought. Um, like I was, um, uh, like they, they just, like at, at Pompeii, there were these burn up, like, uh, you know, the library of Pompeii, they recover this stuff, but it was like really burnt up. So they did this like really complicated, you know, stuff to recover it, you know, through computers. But the text that they came out with was one that's like, you know, a philosophical, you know, explanation of how great, you know, living for pleasure is, which is something that does, you know, that's something that a lot of people live today, the hedonism type thing. But I think you know, what What we're really investing in our love of knowledge or our worship of knowledge isn't exactly in line with that. That's one that's kind of been put to the wayside. I mean, if you're going to do that, you're not saying it's because I'm such a wise guy that I'm doing this. I mean, we just recently did an episode on uh, tongues, and we were talking about kind of spiritual gifts, and there's this part of it where I think it just it gets really overlooked that Paul talks about that knowledge is one of the is one of the spiritual gifts. And I think there's a part of it where, I mean, God's not against knowledge. How could he be against knowledge? What he's against is the worship of knowledge. And so there's this part of it where, I mean, what you're talking about is bringing knowledge under, it's bringing knowledge under the dominion of the Spirit of God. It's, it's the Spirit of God is what drives knowledge because God uses that knowledge to do the work of his kingdom. And that is what the church was doing. I mean, the reason why the phrase that, uh, was it, theology is the queen of the sciences, I mean, that that was said and used is because there was an understanding that that the spirit of God is what drives the proper use of knowledge. As a physicist, I have to say, and of course, physics is the king of. <laughs> 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 That's what we used to say at college. <laughs> physics is obviously the king of all sciences. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> what was computer science? What's that? What was? <laughs> it's, it's not even a science at all. <laughs> But one of the major differences, though, when you think about it, right, is I kind of mentioned it before, but I want to go back to that, which is it is about taking dominion. Why are you doing it, right? Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things that have been given to us, they've been given to us so that we can do them. 
So if you're seeking knowledge for the sake of knowledge, which is what a lot of academia does now, which makes it pretty much useless in a lot of ways, is it's just seeking it to, to say, look how wise we are. Well, that's very different than saying, well, no, our job is to take dominion. And so therefore, we will learn these things as a means to take dominion. And some of that means to take dominion is we have to be able to argue with the people who think that they have this intellectual superiority and go, no, let's actually reason what the world is like because there is, it is part of you know, making the Greek kingdom like chaff on the summer threshing floor. So I don't want to dismiss that, but, but so much of the Greek thought was we're not going off of Mars Hill. We're just sitting at Mars Hill to try to get knowledge. We're not leaving here. And the point of Christianity is it's to leave, to do things. God has given us his word. He's given us knowledge and understanding. He's given us those gifts so that we can do the Great Commission. The next kingdom uh, that we'll be talking about is the, is the Roman Empire. And I think the, the view that we're taking with them is their exaltation of, of law and, and even, a form, even an aspect of dominion with that law, with, with the use of law for dominion. Rome certainly took knowledge from Greece and used it for dominion. In a sense, you know what I mean? Their attitude of knowledge was very different than the Greeks. I mean, this is what Rome was known for, right? Is they were known to be these lawful people that weren't necessarily that lawful, right? I mean, their their law wasn't that great. Somebody kills somebody, you kill a thousand of them, right? Which is what their normal response was to the murder of a Roman citizen. And so it wasn't law like biblical law. It wasn't just, it wasn't unbiased, it wasn't. No, but it was, it was law without mercy almost. Yeah, and it was it's law that's saying that by structuring the society and having a high, highly ordered society, we can be the kingdom that fills the world. And now, you know, when Daniel writes about it, he talks about it that they're like crushing everything with iron, right? It's destroying everything that it comes in contact with because but that was because of their order and their law that they were able to destroy everything they came in contact with. And a consequence of that is a form of peace. Yes. That, you know, there there were certainly long periods in the Roman Empire in which there weren't wars unless Rome was initiating them. If we're looking for salvation through the law or if we're looking for making the law our idol, you know, we run into Galatians 3.21 where Paul says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. And so we have, you know, him exalting um, God's law and saying that it was the law. If any law could have saved you, it would have been God's law, you know, revealed to Moses. But ultimately, you know, men, men fall short and we cannot find salvation through the law. And if we are, you know, trying to just live uh, by the law, that will bring death and destruction. I do think when you look at like destroying the, the remnants of the Roman Empire, it, you, know, you read the, the Great Commission, and it says, teach them to obey all things that I've commanded you. Well, that's a statement of teach them the law. So the issue isn't, I mean, to some extent what Rome gets right is, yeah, everybody should know the law. What they get wrong is they make up their own law, and they say, we're going to do the law that we want to do. We want to do the law that's beneficial to us, and we don't care who it hurts. And so it's their exaltation of law the problem with it wasn't just to say, you know, it's good to be lawful because it is good to be lawful. It was let's use law as a weapon so that we can we can show bias and we can, you know, I'm a Roman citizen, so therefore I get all these special privileges. I can trade because I'm a Roman citizen. And they they use the law not to be a blessing but to be a curse. I mean, ultimately it comes down to what are you going to base your law on? What's your, what's your source and standard of law? And this is, you know, you, you think about, well, draw that thread out through history, and there are many, many different ways that people have tried to answer that question because they realize it's a real question. What do, you, do you base it on hedonism? You know, what is the, the thing? the most powerful man, start well, with Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, I mean, so you, so you could look at these other things and you could say you could base law on who has strength and power, you could base law on what promotes the most amount of pleasure. You could base law on what promotes knowledge. You know, what's a rational way of but, – but ultimately, you're just saying, let's find some human reason. Let's do anything except look to God. So you put law up as, all right, here's the next idol. 
here's the next idol in, in line that we're going to see, and will this one stand? It's really important to see that, and for us to recognize. For instance, every time that there's a shooting, a school shooting, what does everybody say in the government? There ought to be a law. It has to be, we will solve this problem by passing a law. Now, those laws that they say they'll pass, they will never solve the problem because they're not even related to the problem, right? They're complete. They say, well, we're going to pass another gun law, but they think that the gun law will actually remove guns because they have this idolatry of law. And the church is not doing a good job of going, that's stupid. Laws do not work. They do not constrain people. Is it good to punish people? Yes, the punishment for law constrains people. But they think just passing a law that's not enforced because we have lots of gun control laws that are never enforced. Well, guess what? A law that's not enforced does not fix any problem. But yet they go, let's pass another law that won't be enforced, and that will fix the problem. That doesn't fix the problem. But yet there's this love of law and this exaltation. So we have to recognize this this kingdom is alive and well in America. I mean, and the only way that you get that one to work is not actually that one. You, the only way that that's going to work is if you move to to outlawing possession and confiscation. And if you do that, you've now tried to become the gold head. That's where you are. Right. You 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 don't believe in law anymore. Right. And you know. And you can see how the, each of these kingdom rises up, right? Because you have like the, the new Camelot with, with uh, Kennedy. Kennedy and you have the, the wonder kids with, with uh, FDR, right? These are, let's go to the universities and pull the smartest people out from the universities and create a group of people and they'll run the country and they'll produce law. So we'll have Truman. those who worship education or worship knowledge, we'll have them because they'll be the, they'll give the righteous law. Or you have where we are now where it's like, well, what you want to do is you want to make drugs legal and you want to make this legal and you don't want to stop anybody's hedonism. So you see all these elements, right? Because you see that, that yes, they didn't have the same power, but they did have the idea that if you're a Roman citizen, you're not Nebuchadnezzar, but if you're a Roman citizen, you have this authority that you're a special category of person. You have this idea of, Let's, you know, let's consume whatever we want. And again, a lot of it was for the Roman citizens where they were very wealthy and that they had, a, you know, they had excessive consumption. You look at, at the records of some of these emperors and they're pretty disgusting. And then you look at the, the worship of knowledge, as somebody said before, that a lot of that stuff was brought forward from the Greeks. And so they're embedding in their law. They're pulling it from all these sources, which is pretty much what America does. We do very much the same thing rather than saying there should be a standard. And, and for the most part, the church goes, that's good. They don't go, that's bad. They go, that's good, which means you can't destroy that kingdom. If what you're saying is we can pull from wherever we want a source of law, including so the, the church, instead of saying this is what God said about this, what the church does is go, well, vote your conscience or – you know, you should be informed by your, and not going and saying, no, God actually has given us a law, and we should be saying, how do we implement that law in a modern society? There's a part of it where what's happened in recent years is the church has kind of gotten tired of fighting against ideas. You know what I mean? The church has kind of said... I know exactly what you mean. I'm not sure I agree, but I know what you mean. I'm not sure, I mean, I... Is the church tired of fighting against ideas, or do they just go? They want acceptance in a sense of the world, right? They want, and they just don't. They don't want to go. We want to fight. They just want to go. You know, everything's going to get worse. So why fight? Right. I mean, isn't it? I think it's connected to that. There's there's a certain slothfulness that the church has. That's connected to. Might as well eat, drink, and be merry because think, we're going to lose anyway. There are people who say the world's just going to get darker, but there are other people who they stop realizing that the church is – the reason why the world is always different from the church is because the church fights. And, they forgot, and they've almost kind of said we're going to stop fighting against it, and they don't realize that that's at, they've always been what kept it at bay. They've always been what pushed it back. And I think, right, and I agree with that, and I think that part of it is, or a big part of it is, in most churches, people don't want to fight the fight in the church. Right. So if you're not fighting the fight in the church, you'll never fight the fight out of the church. It's that simple. 
if you won't deal with these people who claim to be brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ, if you won't fight those battles there about the worship of these idols, then how can you have any influence on society? And I think that the churches have largely said we shouldn't be fighting inside instead of going, no, there's truth. These things need to be destroyed because they take over the church. I mean, look at, look at, we are now in the, the mega church, right? Where you have these churches that are 20,000 people. Well, that's more of a picture of Nebuchadnezzar than it is a picture of the New Testament church. That's just not what I the don't New think Testament he had light shows. He didn't have light shows. <laughs> he didn't need it. <laughs> but he did the best that he could. He had a golden, you know, a golden statue. And you look, and I just see. music play. I mean. Right. And and inside the church, and then you have churches that they just, instead of going out and doing anything, all they want to do is debate things. Right? I mean, there's lots of churches that are just like, I've read all the Puritans. Well, have you actually gone and preached the gospel to anybody? And there's lots of, I mean, there's a category of churches that are like that. They just start podcasts. They start, well, we do some other things, though. (laughs) We try to. But. You know what I mean? And so it seems to me that in those churches that go, anything goes, you know, we're, we're, let's just, let's just have our light shows. And let's have our, let's dance around and let's, let's scream and let's have a, you know, a laugh offering. And, and so the church can't fight these things when the church is embracing these, these elements of these kingdoms. And these things are pretty widely embraced in churches today. So, I mean, as, I think as we've talked about all these different things, it's really it's, it's probably useful to just kind of go back and say, do you understand, can you see how these things tie together? Can you see how the establishment of Christ's authority, the establishment of his kingdom, the sending forth of the church, the what he sends the church forth to do? I mean, you see all the things in the New Testament about having your mind be renewed, not being conformed to the world, about taking every thought captive, about warring against strongholds, so these, I mean, these things that we think of, we frequently think of them in much smaller ways. Or what is a stronghold? But in the end, these are they're components of these kingdoms that still exist in the world. They're things that people, as the as those kingdoms have shattered, in the sense that we don't have people think that that their kings are are gods anymore, or that even that they have kings for the most part anymore. They still grab those pieces and they try to build and cobble together new ideas and new kingdoms and the church is to be warring against those things the church is to be destroying those ideas casting them down so that people look at them and go why did we ever believe that why did we ever think that was right that we show the foolishness of them and we show that christ is reigning and i think it's important to just kind of if you can understand that it changes the way you view the world and it changes the way you view what god is doing in it and i mean to go back to our first point which was you know People want the rapture because it doesn't matter that everything's getting worse. And now God has given us real work to do. And when we take that attitude, it's it's incredibly damaging, not just to the church, not just to the kingdom of God, not just to the expansion of the kingdom, but it's incredibly damaging to us because we've joined in the purposelessness of the society around us. And the reality is you look at America and I think I was reading in in uh, in New York like an incredibly high percentage of children in the public school system like like 20% or something are not sure what gender they are. This is the hopelessness that comes because the church goes nothing matters. The church can't have a message that things matter when they're saying nothing matters. Because if Christ is not purifying the kingdom of God, if he's not if he's not ruling the nations with a rod of iron, if he's not sending his people forth to actually expand and to destroy these kingdoms, then expand the kingdom of God and destroy these kingdoms of the world, then there's no purpose to anything. And so what we've done is by embracing the rapture theology, what we have done is made the world a very hopeless place. And I don't think, I don't think people in the church they just go, well, I'm comfortable. The rapture theology makes me comfortable because when the rapture happens, I'll be fine, and I'll go, I'll go evangelize and try to get people into the church. I don't want to teach them to obey all things Christ commanded because he's going to come back next week. They won't learn anything by then. And all of a sudden, there's no 
purpose. There's no direction. There's the world becomes a useless place, and that's what the church has taught America in particular. I mean, what you're saying, if I'm listening correctly, is the rapture is a form of hedonism. The rapture is a is a is a if we're taking it in the sense of it was cobbled together from one of these, and you know, what I mean, it's it's, it's an idea that, that needs to be destroyed. It's an idea that needs to be destroyed, and you you know, you look at it right and. There were leaders like Schofield and Darby, and there were people that pushed it hard that actually the only reason they pushed it was for their own power because right. it made no sense. But because it's a, and it's a form kind of, of Gnosticism, because it's this form of special knowledge that says this is how you're supposed to, to treat it, that gave individuals power like the Babylonian Empire. It also, like you said, it means that you don't need to deal with sin in your own life, so it's very hedonistic, so it has that element in it. You have the element of special knowledge, like I said before, that you can't get it from the scriptures. You have to bring in extra knowledge in order to get to the to the modern rapture theology. It has to do with reading the parables in a certain order, even though Christ said what the parables mean. They twist it. You have to not take things in context, like you have to sub- sap- separate Matthew 24 from Luke 21. I mean, you just have to really twist things around, and the only way you can get there is with special knowledge. So they're seeking something new is what Darby was doing when he came up with it. Right. And so, and, and the other thing is they're trying to control people through the law and saying this is what you have to believe. And, and so, yeah, the, the rapture theology, I would argue, very much is a product of all these kingdoms. And the church should be tearing it down instead of embracing it. The little Christian who says, where, where am I? What do I do? You go to Matthew 28 and you say, all authority has been given to Jesus. All authority. He, he has authority over all ideas. He has authority over all kingdoms, over all powers, all principalities. He has all authority. And where in that story are we? Well, we're somewhere in Psalm 110, the early verses, where you're a volunteer and Jesus is reigning and he's waiting for all his enemies to be a footstool. And all of these things are, I mean, the stone hit, it crushed them. Those kingdoms are, are, are done. And what is left is humans are now trying to reconstruct the little parts. And the Christian's supposed to take his hammer and make some more rubble. They're supposed to go back and keep destroying those things until they are the chaff that Christ says that they will be, that blows away and it is no more. When they are no more, when you read Psalm 110, where it says we'll be a volunteer in the day of his power, what that means is what God brings to you, that's what you should do. You should volunteer. So if you see a situation, instead of saying somebody else will deal with it, you go, I can deal with this, so I'll go deal with it. And a lot of times we can make it too, way too complicated. Right? We can go, well, do I have this? Do I have this? What, what, what ministry can I create? What can, instead of just going, I should be ready to volunteer. And that's what the Christian needs to do. When he hears something, he goes, wait a second. They're, they're out there saying that, that gun control will solve our problems with guns. Well, I'll speak because I'll go, there's no salvation by the law. And we need to have an attitude of being volunteers for whatever – opportunity, whatever ministry God gives, whatever little rock we can break into smaller dust. And we need to be ready to do that and willing to do that. That's what it starts with. And I think a lot of times people want to go, let's have a great ministry. Instead, go minister. What you're saying is just a really simple, straightforward, if you see a problem, then you should then you should be asking what do you, God has revealed this problem to me? Is it really a problem according to Scripture? Yes, it's really a problem according to Scripture. Then somehow or other, I need to do something about it. And either I am equipped to do something about it now, or I need to go figure out what I need to do to be equipped to solve this problem. Or a third one, I go, I point out the problem to somebody who can solve it. Because a lot of times that's being a volunteer I too. Didn't want to mention that one because I think that's what we would all like to do. Okay, there's this problem. Let's go point it out to the pastor. Yeah. Right, and the pastor should go, and pastors need to be going, no, all Christians are volunteers in the day of God, Christ's power, so you can handle this. What help do you need? Here's a book. I'll, I'll give you this book that you can read. And everybody needs to be willing to do that instead of just going, 
I mean, I understand what you're saying, yeah, but, yeah. but the reality is pastors need to be going, no, you have to be doing stuff. And that message has to be in the pulpit. We're, we're saved. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus created. We are his workmanship created for good works. And if that message isn't in the, the church, then people are just going to say, I'll hand this to the pastor. But that's not volunteering. That's just passing the buck. If they can do something, they have to do it. They can't just pass the buck. But sometimes they can. Sometimes they do need somebody else to do it. And I wasn't thinking, take it to the pastor. That's a terrible idea, Jonathan. (laughs) (laughs) Pastor got plenty to do. (laughs) God put his church here to do good works. He saves everybody to do good works. We're supposed to be about the work of expanding the kingdom of God. Don't let any excuse draw you away from what God says he does for everyone who's saved, which you're a new creature to do good works. Figure out good what good works God would have you to do because everyone he saves, he has a plan for their life to do something useful for him. Everyone who's saved, everyone in the new covenant, everyone who's, who's saved and given the Holy Spirit, every one of them will produce fruit. What fruit are you producing? Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.